Let's talk about discerning the voice of God. So first, let's turn to John chapter 14 and verse 26, where Jesus said, The accuser, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall accuse you day and night, and bring all your shortcomings to your remembrance, whatsoever a tradition of man has wrongly interpreted from the Bible. So what we learn here, ooh, ooh, that's not what it says. Hmm, this is embarrassing. I apparently was ill-prepared. It seems that it actually says, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So the first lesson is that God sends you a comforter, an accuser, devil is what, devil means accuser. So if it's accusation, that's the voice of the devil. If it's comfort, that's a voice of God. And I keep going back to this whole thing with the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and how important that is because Jesus was healing and they decided that since he wasn't the kind of person they thought God would work through, that the healing that he was doing must have been from the devil. So they had a devil that looked like God and sounded like God and acted like God and did God-like things, which much of religion today does. And I was listening to a preacher, and he was marveling at the fact that people could have witnessed these things that Jesus was doing and not have believed. And I was thinking the whole time because they thought he was doing it by the power of the devil because he was a bastard and he was a glutton and he was a drunkard and he sat with sinners. So he was a sinner himself and absolutely positively, that's not the kind of person God would work through. God doesn't work through sinners. That's what they said in the book of John when the blind man was healed and they said, can a sinner heal the heal the blind you know god doesn't do doesn't work that way and the blind man said i don't know anything about that but i know i was blind and now i see so he understood he didn't assign it to the power of the devil he just said praise god i see now but the religious leadership objected to the idea that god would work through somebody like jesus and so they didn't see it as a power of God. They conflated God with the devil, and that was what the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost was. And as long as you continue to confuse whether something is God or whether something is the devil, or you have a two-faced God, or you have a God who's unpredictable, then you're going to have these kinds of issues and these kinds of problems. And so it's important to be able to discern what the voice of God is and what the Word of God is so that when you come across things that say the Word of God does something or the Word of God has some kind of power what is the Word of God? What does that look like? What does that sound like? Does it mean a book that was put together by 4th century Catholics? Or is there something within that book and even not in that book, but just what comes to you personally and individually. The still small voice within, that is the Word of God. And that's the important thing to understand, because in this book is so much that is misunderstood, misrepresented. And so, if I were to say, for example, I could make a statement that would be very specific in the ability to be understood, that you'd have to know certain things about 2019 culture in the United States. And so if I were to say, hey, something new happened this year. The Patriots won the Super Bowl. First of all, you'd know that's sarcasm because there's nothing whatsoever new about the Patriots winning the Super Bowl. But there's a lot of other things in there that are specific to our culture that in 2019 and near future after 2019 would be understood 
and it would be understood that this was sarcasm. It would be understood that the Patriots are a athletic organization, and it would be understood that the Super Bowl is a competition, a championship of athletic organizations. So to say that the Patriots won the Super Bowl is to be sarcastic, that there's nothing new about it, and that it's an athletic organization that yet again, and predictably, won the championship. But think a few hundred years from now, 500 years from now, a thousand years from now, 2,000 years from now. What if somebody were to come across something that said something new happened this year? The Patriots won the Super Bowl. Think about how wrongly that could be interpreted. Think about the fact that they might not know the sarcasm of the fact that it wasn't new, that it was predictable and expected and conforming to a, a pattern of recent history, that it's something that's happened repeatedly. There's nothing new about it. That was sarcasm. But also, they might think that the Patriots are a force that is loyal to the government. And they might think that the Super Bowl is some kind of revered or holy item like the Holy Grail. It's some kind of bowl that maybe the one who possesses it, they they get to take power or it, it's the approval of God that they are the ones in power. And so somebody might interpret that as something new happening instead of understanding the sarcasm there. And they might think that the new thing that happened was that the forces loyal to the government had seized upon this holy item and secured their power against the rebel forces. Do you see how completely and utterly wrong that is to what is actually being said that was talking about a sporting event that had an utterly predictable outcome and that there's nothing whatsoever new about it and it's simply a sporting event it had nothing to do with armed forces and so these are specific cultural references that are understood by understanding certain specifics like understanding that there's a sporting team called the Patriots and that it's not a reference to forces loyal to the government, but that was what the team was named in honor of, but that's not what they are. They are not an armed force loyal to the government. They're a sporting team. And that the Super Bowl is not an actual bowl that is revered for some kind of power it holds, but it's just a championship of that sporting event. So there's so much that can be completely misunderstood by taking things at face value without having an understanding of the time and the culture and the idioms specific to that time and culture. Things like sarcasm can be missed. Things like specific cultural references like the fact that the Patriots are a sporting team and not forces loyal to the government can be completely missed. Very specific things like the Super Bowl is not an item, but is rather a championship of sporting events. So these are things that we understand that it makes perfect sense to us. It's, the, it's not mystifying anyone, but in another couple hundred years or more, people might be mystified by some statement like that and might have a completely fantastic version of of what it actually meant. Like I described, here this military force has seized a holy item and secured their power. That's not at all what it has to do with. It's so far off the mark, it's ridiculous, which is the whole point of the illustration. It is ridiculous. And the problem is that people read the Bible and there are many places where such things occur and the interpretation of it is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous, and we don't know what it says. It's not what it says at all. So what we need to do is to have tools of discernment so that we can at least understand what we're looking at and get an idea of what we do or don't know and what might just need to be shelved and say, well, I don't know what that means, and that's okay. And so the main thing, though, is to know the difference between God and the devil, to know the voice of God, to know what it is that it sounds like when it is God, and to know what it is that actually is important or not. So 
one of the things that you can do, I think, is a tool, is in John chapter 1. So in John chapter 1, we can do some word substitution starting there. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So since this is equating the Word with God, then we need to be able to substitute other things in there and see if they are consistent with what kind of image or word would be from God. So, for example, we could substitute in certain doctrines and see if they're actually important or not. So, many doctrines that are completely considered foundational, fundamental, important, of utmost sanctity, and people get called heretics for disagreeing with those doctrines, and yet they're either absent entirely from the Bible or the result of poor interpretation of the Bible. But we can substitute in words in these first few verses and see either how consistent it is or how silly it is. So what is the word? Because that right there in itself is misrepresented. So let's just start with that and kill that. In the beginning was a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century. And a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century was with God. And a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century was God. All things were made by a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century. And without a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century was not anything made that was made. Does that seem right? Does that seem sensible? No, it does not. So the word does not refer to a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century. That can't be what the word is. So let's explore what the word is because that's not it. Furthermore, let's look at some other things that are not important doctrines. So we'll substitute more words. In the beginning was the devil, and the devil was with God, and the devil was God. I don't think so. So, whether or not you believe in the devil as a supernatural spirit being rivaling to God is apparently unimportant, because the devil is not God. And the devil did not make everything. It's not all things were made by the devil, and without the devil was not anything made that was made. No, wrong. The devil is not God. So that is not an important doctrine. How about this? In the beginning was, in the beginning was eternal conscious torment after you die. And eternal conscious torment after you die was with God. And eternal conscious torment after you die was God. All things were made by eternal conscious torment after you die, and without eternal conscious torment after you die was not anything made that was made. That's ridiculous. We can throw that out. That's not an important doctrine. That's useless to anybody. How about another one? In the beginning was the rapture, and the rapture was with God, and the rapture was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by the rapture, and without the rapture was not anything made that was made. I'm thinking that we can throw that one out. How about this? In the beginning was total depravity, and total depravity was with God, and total depravity was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by total depravity, and without total depravity was not anything made that was made. I don't think total depravity made anything, and I don't think total depravity is God. How about its, its cousin, original sin? In the beginning was original sin, and original sin was with God, and original sin was God. Well, that sickens me. I don't even want to hear that again. I don't even want to play that back. So, what could we put there that might work? In the beginning was love, and love was with God, and love was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by love, and without love was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was peace, and peace was with God, and peace was God. In the beginning was kindness, and kindness was with God, and kindness was God. In the beginning was goodness, and goodness was with God, and goodness was God. So what is the Word of God? The Word of God can be very well reflected 
by what we call the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That is the Word of God. What is the Word of God? The Word of God is what is spoken to you that brings you these things. This is the tool of discernment. The tool of discernment isn't a doctrine that you adhere to. The tool of discernment is what it does to you and what it provokes you to do. That's what the tool of discernment is. The fruit of the Spirit is a very good tool of discernment as to whether what you're hearing is from God or not. And also, the contrast between accusation and comfort is a very good tool. And there's so many places that you can substitute in different things. So we go to Hebrews chapter 1. It says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he has by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. So here it says that in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. So let's be clear that what it doesn't say is, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. No, it says by his Son, who is the appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. And so, if the Son is who speaks to us, and the Son is the express image of his person, and the Son is the brightness of his glory, and the Son is upholding all things by the word of his power, then we need to look at the Son to see what the word of God is. We need to look to Jesus to find out what that is all about, because it says that the Son is the express image of his person. He is the exact representation of the nature and the character of God. He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So he is the representation of what God is like. And when Jesus was challenged to say, bring down fire on those who didn't conform to his doctrine, or weren't nice to him, or whatever the reason was, he said, you don't know what spirit of you are. That's not how I roll. That's not what kind of person God is. So that's the kind of tools of discernment that you see, is to see if it looks like Jesus, then it might look like God. And if it doesn't look like Jesus, it definitely doesn't look like God. And so we're going to start out by looking at one of the things that is very central to common in religion and evangelical Christianity is to challenge people and say, you know, prove that you're saved or what are the, what are your fruits? We're, we're fruit inspectors. We want you to prove that you're saved, prove that you're a son of God. But the thing is, what is recorded, God says, this is my beloved son. And there's Never a voice from God that says, if you be the Son of God, prove it. But we see in Genesis that the serpent said, Yea, has God said. And a lot of times that is used to say that there's a deceiving, deceiving voice trying to discredit your interpretation of the Bible. But it doesn't say, yeah, has the holy book have written in it. It says, yea, has God said. Which means God spoke to you, personally and individually. And so here's a deceiving voice challenging what it was that you heard. And I remember having my own experience where I felt that as though I had heard from God. And what I had was a fundamentalist tell me, look at this verse, look at this verse, look at this verse, whatever you thought you heard, it was wrong. So, which is really yea has got said? Look at this Bible verse. Here's what I think it means. Therefore, what you think you heard from God is wrong. 
Or as yea hath God said, you might have misinterpreted what you thought you read in the Bible. Or it might not have been translated accurately. Or somebody might have had an agenda when they put that word there. Or somebody might have had an agenda when they told you what it meant. Or maybe there was a lesson being taught there that maybe the story was about people who had a misinterpretation of what kind of person God was like. And if you follow the story, you see what the logical conclusion is of having that kind of misunderstanding about who God is. And you see what kind of society is made and is born of that kind of misunderstanding of what kind of person God is. Maybe you need to follow the story and see what the lesson of it is. Maybe you shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that since one of the characters in the story said God said something, that God actually said it. Maybe you should trust what God says to you. And maybe you can have a tool of discernment to figure out whether that word is from God or not. So maybe it's not really a matter of saying, well, is it in the Bible? Because the answer is yes, it is. Hey, good news. Um, yeah, I heard from God today. He said, kill everybody and burn the city to the ground. Oh yes, that is in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it is in the Bible. So I guess I should go ahead and do that. That must have been God who told me. No, that's a stupid way of discerning whether something is got from God or not. And that's why we have people suspicious of people that say they hear from God. Because they do stupid things like that, and it's in the Bible. It is. There is people doing things like that and claiming that God said that. So maybe you should follow the logical conclusion and see what the moral of the story was. So that's not the tool of discernment to use, is is it in the Bible? Because the answer is yes. I don't even need to know what it was that was said. I can tell you the answer is yes. So the question is, what is the voice of God versus the voice of the devil? The first clue is comfort versus accusation. The first clue is, this is my beloved son versus if you be the son of God. And that's what we're going to look at now. So we look in Matthew chapter 3, and Jesus is being baptized. And it says in verse 13, Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and you come to me. And Jesus answering said to him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So what we see is that the, God, uh, the Spirit of God descends like a dove. It says like a dove and dove representing peace. So the Spirit of God descends and takes hold of you. And despite the, the kind of violent imagery that provokes, it's bringing you peace. Suddenly, and descending like a, like a dove, but it lights upon you and it's peace. And a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So the voice of God affirms your sonship. The voice of God affirms him being well pleased. We see the same thing in Mark chapter 1. And again, there came a voice from heaven saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so it's not like these things happened multiple times. These are just various reports, but we can see that it's in, it's in three of the four Gospels. The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. So there it is in Luke chapter 3 again. A third affirmation. This is obviously important that the voice of God expresses sonship. It says, it says that you're the son or daughter and it says that he's well pleased. That's what that that would be a much more biblically sound doctrine to have that when you die you stand before God and God introduces you and says, "This is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased." Hey everybody. Let's meet this person. Whatever whatever insert your name here. Insert name here. This is my beloved son, Mike, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved daughter, Angie, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son, Jason, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved daughter, Jessica, in whom I am well pleased. Or whatever. 
insert your name there. That would actually be a more biblically sound doctrine than one in which you stand before God and he points a finger of accusation and demands that you justify why he should find you to be acceptable in his sight. That is not God. That is the devil. And so, now we contrast that. And we go and we see in Matthew chapter 4, this is shortly following what just happened. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So, let's just stop here. Tempted actually has to do with being accused. It does not mean being enticed to do the things that, you know, to do the prohibited things that you really want to do. And that's one of the words religion has really screwed up by making tempted this allure of of delving into that which is prohibited and forbidden and taboo. And you're being tempted like, oh, doesn't it doesn't it seem like it would be so good to partake of this? But what tempted actually has to do, and this is a word study for the future, is it has to do with being tested in order to make an accusation of you. So tempted is always tied with the intent to accuse. And while it's not accusation itself, it wouldn't be that far off to just substitute the word accused every time you see the word tempted. And you'd have a better understanding of what's being said if you put accused instead of enticed or allured or seduced or something like that that religion has told you to put there. So Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be accused of the devil, which means accuser. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the accuser came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be bread. So what's the accusation? That you're not the Son of God. And if you are the Son of God, then prove it. That's what religion says. That's what religion makes accusation. If you're the Son of God, then prove it. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so, that's actually a reference to Deuteronomy in chapter 8, verse 3, where he, uh, where God says that he suffered them to suffer hunger in the wilderness, so, uh, but fed them with manna so that they would know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Again, we come to one of these points where we can substitute in, what does that mean? And so, here we could say, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word written in a collection of writings canonized by the Catholic Church in the 4th century. That's not what it says. That's not what it means. It's every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the mouth of God is to your ear, the still small voice inside. God is Emmanuel. He's not out there somewhere on planet third heaven waiting to have you justify whether he's he can find you acceptable in your sight after you die. He's Emmanuel, God in you and within you. God with you and within you. And so the words out of the mouth of God are going to be something that is heard by you. And so that's what we're looking at is the tools of discernment to know whether it's the word of God. Well, we just saw that the word of God out of the mouth of God is this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The word out of the devil is if you are the son of God, now prove it. So, what is the word of God? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't challenge whether you are the son of God. Then the devil takes him up to the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and says, If you are the son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you. And in their hands they shall bear you, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. And that's from Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. And so Jesus said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And what's interesting is that this is actually referencing... Okay, here we go. Um, apparently I aligned these up a little wrong. Yeah, so here we go. Yeah, Psalms 91. And this is the one that starts out with, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. And so this is one of the, the passages that people use to comfort themselves, that God is on their side. And he says, here, for you shall give the angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear up thee in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon, and you shall trample under your feet, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. So this is what the devil's referring to him. Call upon him, and he'll answer you. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. I will show him my salvation. And so now we go and we see what he's referencing when Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. So what's really interesting here is that the devil's saying, referencing Psalm 91 and saying, you know, if you're the son of God, then prove that God's on your side by casting yourself off of here. And Jesus says not to tempt God. But here's what it's actually referencing, because now we go back to Exodus chapter 17. And it says, And the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. So here's what I was saying before about commandment is an instruction. It's not a demand made under threat of punishment. They were following, they were, uh, in their journeys according to the instruction of the Lord. It wasn't a demand made that they that they wander through the wilderness. It was an instruction that they follow a certain path. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? So again, tempt has to do with making an accusation. It is a test in order to make an accusation. So what's the accusation? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So there's the accusation. You brought us out of Egypt to kill us. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And, and the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you the elders of Israel and your rod, wherewith you smote the river, take in your hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So that's a key right there. They, they tempted, which is related to accusation, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So what is Jesus being challenged to do? What's he referencing? He's saying, I don't need, I know who I am. I don't need to find out if God is with me or not. That's what he's referencing. They made an accusation that they were being dragged out into the wilderness to be killed and accused God of not being with them. And he said, I don't need to know whether God is with me. I know who I am. You're challenging if I'm the son of God, I need to prove it. I don't need to prove a thing. I know who I am. So then we get to verse 8. Again, the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says unto him, All these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So what's interesting is he references Deuteronomy 6.13, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and you shall swear by his name. But verse 14 it says, You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. So what he's referencing is he's saying that I'm not going to worship the God that you worship, this God of power, this God of, of ruling by lordship over others. And they had a God of ruling by lordship. And he said, that's not my God. I don't worship that God. I refuse to worship this God where I'm going to be intoxicated by power and lordship and dominion over people and treating people as my slaves. That's not what I'm here to do. So we see in Matthew chapter, I think I'm in the same verse. same uh, Luke chapter 4. Yeah, that's what it is. Luke chapter 4. And we have... 
another parallel of the same account. And so we just see the same thing where in verse 3, the devil said to him, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And it says in verse 9, it says, uh, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down from hence, because the angels will catch you. Uh, referencing, again, Psalm 91. And so that's what the devil says. The devil says, if you're the Son of God, then prove it. And what, is, what does God say? We go to Matthew chapter 17, and it says, And after six days Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them to a high mountain part, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And then Peter said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make us here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a, behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. So the voice of God says, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And we see that in Mark 9, 7. Again, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly when they looked round about, they saw no man anymore save Jesus only with themselves. So Jesus had replaced the law and the prophets. And again in Luke 9, 35, there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. So a voice that says, This is my beloved Son, hear him, is a voice of God. A voice that says, If you be the Son of God, is a voice from the devil. Let's see who else says, If you're the Son of God, then let's prove it. Um, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 39, it says, They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, You that destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if you will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, then they heard that said, This man calls for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, Let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. So the accusation of if you be the Son of God is being made by, amongst others, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. So the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders are in the same camp as the devil. Possibly even, you've been taught a wrong interpretation, and they are the devil. And so if you understand the kind of violent conflict that was occurring, calling the people that want to kill you the devil really isn't that much of a stretch. It really isn't that much of an exaggeration. It's really quite normal and logical and reasonable to call the people that want to kill you the devil. And doesn't necessarily have to be what it's interpreted to be, typically. So the devil says, if you're the son of God, here's some things that you need to do to prove it. And the devil even invents the things that you need to do to prove it. He's the one that's the arbiter of what it is that you need to do to prove it. The devil is always making demands of you that you prove your worthiness. And the God says, this is, and God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So what else do we know about what God sounds like? Well, we know in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 8, it gives us some more attributes of what God is like and what we can discern whether something comes from God or not. And it says, Charity suffers long and is in kind and is kind. Charity envies not 
Charity vaunts not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails. So charity is agape, and agape is perfect love. Agape is love that gives, wanting nothing in return, seeking nothing in return, needing nothing in return, being fulfilled in the very giving of itself. So that's what God is. God is one who gives love, wanting, needing, or expecting nothing in return, and feeling fulfilled in the very giving of the love itself. So God's not putting us on a test where he's he's looking peering around the corner like a stalker going is the love going to be returned to me is the love going to be returned to me oh i'm so insecure and need the validation to know whether you love me back like i love you no the love is given wanting nothing in return needing nothing in return expecting nothing in return and feeling as though the fulfillment was in the very giving of it itself so we see these attributes that God is long-suffering. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not boast in himself. He does not seek himself. He is not uh, easily provoked. He keeps no record of wrongs. He doesn't rejoice in one person being elevated above another, which is what iniquity actually is. But he rejoices in the truth. And we know that there's a test for the truth. The truth, the test for the truth is that if it's the truth, it'll make you free indeed. But religion seems to think that uh, the truth will make you fear indeed, but it's the, the truth will make you free indeed. So how do you even know if it's the truth? Well, did it make you free? There's your answer. If it did, then it was the truth. God bears all things. So he's not, he's not putting the weight on your shoulders. He's bearing it himself believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never fails. So God's not leaving it in your hands as to whether he's successful or not in his mission. Because God never fails. Now we get back around to the fruit of the Spirit, which was a tool of discernment. And so if what you think you hear from God, or what you're hearing from any source regardless of what that source is. If it brings you these things or provokes you to these things, then it is the Word of God. The Word of God brings you love or provokes you to love. The Word of God brings you joy or provokes you to joy. The Word of God brings you peace or provokes you to be peaceful. The Word of God brings you long-suffering or provokes you to be long-suffering. The Word of God brings you gentleness or provokes you to gentleness. The Word of God brings you goodness or provokes you to goodness. The Word of God brings you faith or provokes you to faith. The Word of God brings you meekness or provokes you to meekness. The Word of God brings you temperance, self-control, or provokes you to self-control. And I want to take a look at this one chart that I made up. And this is not an exact, perfect, precise tit for tat, you know, one one item for another, but it's an illustration. And the illustration can show you on the left hand what the word of God brings to you and provokes you to versus what the fruit of the law is. And this could be the fruit of the law, this could be the fruit of focusing on shortcomings, this could be the you could call it the fruit of the devil, you could call it the fruit of sin consciousness, you could call it the fruit of valuing people by their performance. You could call it the fruit of, because what it really is, the, val- the fruit of the law is to value people by how well they conform to the do's and don'ts that were dispensed by your denomination. How well do they conform to those do's and don'ts? And here's what the outcome is. So instead of love, you have fear. Instead of joy, there's despair and grief. Instead of peace, insecurity, striving, and divisiveness. Instead of long-suffering, bitterness, and being easily angered. Instead of gentleness, condemnation, and accusation. Instead of goodness, spite, and envy. Instead of faith in one another, there's suspicion towards others and distrust. Instead of meekness, there's strife, wrath, and vengefulness. And instead of temperance, there's being easily provoked. So... By contrast of what the Word of God brings, if you 
are put into fear or despair or grief or insecurity or made to be striving and divisive or are bitter or easily angered or condemnation or accusation, spite, envy, suspicion towards others, distrust, strife, wrath, vengefulness, or being easily provoked. That is not the word of God. Period. And it doesn't matter where the source came from, just as much as it doesn't matter where the source came from if it was love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith in one another, meekness, or temperance. The source didn't matter. It's God if it conforms to one, or it's not God if it conforms to the other. It's a tool of discernment that tells you. That's the whole point of it being there. The fruit of the Spirit is. What is the Word? The Word is a seed. The word, that seed is planted in your heart when you accept it, when you eat it, when you eat that fruit, then that is when you accept it and internalize it. That seed is planted in the ground of your heart, and from that grows more, grows the fruit of the Spirit. And so what is growing out of your heart is based on what fruit you're eating. What word are you consuming? So if you consume fear, then what will grow from you is fear. If you consume love, what will grow from you is love. The Word of God is the seed that sprouts these things out of you and gives you these feelings and promotes them in your own action. And so program yourself and be around sources that promote the, the left-hand column and not the right-hand column. The Word of God is going to sound like these things over here. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith in one another, meekness, and temperance. The word of the devil is going to be fear. It's going to be despair. It's going to be grief. It's going to be insecurity. It's going to tell you to be suspicious of people and to be distrustful. It's going to tell you that things are trick, uh, that everything's a trick of the devil. It brings us right back to that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. This is what you get when you get a a performance based valuation of people. That their value is based on how well they conform to the do's and don'ts of your denomination. That's what law is, and that's what you get from that. So to close, we go to Revelation 12 and verse 10, and it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, and this would be what God sounds like, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. 